Shalom, I'm Dr. Deanna Dye with Foundations in Torah and HRN, and we are going through a series called Dietrich Bonhoeffer, A Sign for Our Times. Last time we talked about the birth pangs of the Messiah. We took some scriptures and tried to show you how we're really coming into the time of the birth pangs again. I've chosen Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and hopefully by the end of the series you will know well who he is and you will read more about him. In fact, one book I really recommend is The Cost of Discipleship. But he was the voice of his time, his generation in pre-World War II in Germany who spoke out against the German regime, against the Nazis in defense of the Jewish people. And he's a very inf important figure. He was an influential figure at the time, even though uh, his life was taken shortly before the end of the war. But I, I feel that the, the signs and the things that were going on in Germany are certainly very comparable to what we're experiencing, certainly here in the United States and, and around the world. Uh, history repeating itself always, the patterns continue to repeat. This is the very nature of the Bible and Scripture, that everything is a repeating pattern to teach us, instruct us, and prepare us and help us not to make the same mistakes, although we seem to always make the same mistakes. But where we left off as we kind of began to introduce Bonhoeffer, uh, we're looking at his life, and I talked about the importance and the significance in his life in terms of his study. He took a great amount of time to study the Tanakh, the uh, what we call the Old Testament, and also in, in, in research, and he incorporated the Psalms in his prayer life. And so from that he recognized that the Jewish people were the apple of God's eye, and that if one uh, spoke out against or did harm to the Jewish people. It was as if they were doing harm to God himself. He was at times a lone voice in Germany, but uh, there were those that joined on with him. He, uh, these were, the, the, the state church was the Lutheran church, and in the example of Germany, the church and the state were pretty well married together. Uh, they didn't have the concept of what we have in the United States. Um, the, now I know many of you think that Maybe you think that the concept of the separation of church and state is in our Constitution, and it, and it isn't. It was actually from a letter written to uh, by Jefferson to the Danbury Baptists. But the idea of what the Constitution was saying is that the, the church could be guaranteed that the government would there would be a wall between them and the government would stay out of the business of the church. Um, not uh, the, the other way around in, in which we have to destroy the church because it's so tightly connected to the government. But what, he, what Bonhoeffer and friends created w was a new thing in Germany called the Confessing Church. And the Confessing Church was designed to kind of replace the state church because the state, as I said, the state church was basically married to the state. Um, he understood well that the Nazis were um, attacking God by attacking God's people. And he understand, understood the importance of who the Jewish people were from the scriptures. He recognized that Yeshua the Messiah was Jewish, that the culture of the first century was Jewish, and that everything about it uh, had this sort of Hebrew flavor. And he, that was very important to him. He basically made the determination that he would give his life to save the Jewish people. And his goal was to wake up the church in Germany. Of course, his uh, eternal reward was he was hung two weeks before the Allies came in uh, April 1945. But he, he left a long-lasting legacy, and the things he wrote and the things he wrestled with are, are part of, can be part of our culture today and help prepare us for what's ahead. So we have uh, this little slide here, again, of, of Bonhoeffer with a, a quote. It, he had a deep abiding faith in God. And he, there's a quote up on here. He says, judging others makes us blind, whereas love is illuminating. By judging others, we blind ourselves to our own evil and to the grace which with uh, others are just as entitled to as ourselves. He, great quotes here. But again, he, a deep abiding faith in God he worshiped God through the Psalms, which I found to be quite compelling. This is not something that I knew about him, and it's really not something that you read too much about many, uh, certainly not in the, the church in Germany at the time, but this is not something that you read much about. And so his whole life in prayer and worship was through the Psalms. He saw the value of them, what they communicated, 
Uh, he recognized their connection to the Jewish people. Now, he, you know, he wasn't a Hebrew roots believer, if you will. He, he didn't uh, celebrate the festivals or set aside the Shabbat. But he worshipped in a way through the Psalms that I dare say many of us have never experienced uh, to a depth of his soul. So our next picture of him, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was a German theologian. He was born in 1906, he died in 1945, and he had a major influence on post-World War II Protestant theology. Very, very significant there. Of course, he was executed because of his part in the German resistance, and he was part of the plot to kill Hitler. Um, but through all his actions and his words and his writings, he, had, he called for Christians to be involved in the world and not to separate themselves from it. And certainly Yeshua said, you are in the world, but you are not of the world kind of thing. But we live in this physical world and we have an obligation to defend the fatherless and to defend the orphans and the widows and those that are, are of God who are being persecuted. We have a responsibility there. Um, we have a, a photo here of him and his twin sister. He was born on February 4th, 1906 in Breslau. He was the sixth of eight children. And when he was six years old, the family moved to Berlin, where he was educated at uh, several universities of Tübingen and in Berlin. And he was, uh, he was awarded a doctorate in 1927 at the ripe young age of 21. So he was a very brilliant guy, and he decided to become a theologian. Uh, we have a picture here of his mother and his father. His father was a leading professor of neurology and psychiatry, and his mother was the granddaughter of a distinguished church historian. So he came from a very well-to-do family. Uh, his parents were highly educated. And actually is somewhat interesting to me because lots of times in sort of that culture, um, people don't tend to really identify with the downtrodden, but it was that was not the case in his family. And uh, they had a love for the Jewish people. That's all he really ever knew in his family. And his, his uh, father and mother were, were very uh, strong believers in the community. Again, another uh, photo we have up here of, of Bonhoeffer. He, his uh, doctoral dissertation was called The Communion of the Saints, was written in 1930. And uh, he, he introduced some of these characteristics. He, he had a passionate concern that Christianity um, become a concrete reality in the real world of men. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about this. Because he was a Christian. He was a part of the church in Germany. Um, and we don't want to separate ourselves from the whole community. And this is, this is the place where he was and where he served and where he thought and where he wrestled. And he was a theologian. So he wanted to see that faith exercised out as a concrete reality in the real world of men. His was a completely Christ-centered, Yeshua-centered approach to theology. He was very grounded in the New Testament as well as the Old. And... Um, he had an intense preoccupation with the church that Yeshua Christ would exist as the community. And that was his basis from which he, he went, how he wrote, and how he communicated. And that certainly, that's his framework at that particular time. Um, we have a, a photo here of him. He actually headed off to uh, the United States at one point uh, in 1931. He actually was introduced to sort of the worship in Harlem, as you can imagine, under Adam Powell. And he was, uh, he was very influenced by that. He'd never seen anything like it. So consider in his own life how he, he had incorporated the Psalms in his own prayer time and his own worship in life. Now, I don't, if you contrast the Lutheran church with a, a church in Harlem, that would be quite a contrast. So, you know, Germans tend to be quite staid and... Uh, he was not used to that sort of expression, uh, physical expression. So he was very touched by that. It was a very, it was very, very important in his life. This experience that he had in Harlem, and he actually ended up going uh, back to Germany. And at another point, he went back to the United States, thinking that he would serve in uh, Chicago as a theologian. Uh, but he actually felt led by God to go back to uh, Germany just when the war was starting. Uh, we have another picture here of this, um, 
when he was in the United States. Um, after he, he was actually served as a curator of the German-speaking congregation in Barcelona. He spent uh, his academic year, 3031, in the United States as a Sloan Fellow at the uh, Union Theological Seminary. Um, his, now, at this time, some of his writings reveal he's, he's talking about Christ's whole being is being for man. Um, he talks about his powerlessness and humiliation for man's sake are the fullest disclosure of power and majesty. I think the way he thought and the way he wrestled with uh, these, these important uh, doctrines of the day, uh, these are things that many of us never think about. But uh, he was a man, a, a very s smart, brilliant man who uh, really dissected these things and really wanted to be able to communicate them to people. And so he recognized Yeshua's seemingly powerlessness and his humiliation that he that he gave for the sake of man, and so he uh, he saw in that this great display of the majesty and power of God in what Yeshua did. Uh, Bonhoeffer was part of the German resistance movement, and so uh, as war became increasingly obvious. Um, they want, his friends wanted him out of Dodge, if you will, so, and, and they arranged really for him to ha be on a lecture tour in the United States, and we kind of just talked about that. Uh, this, but at one point, he was just there a short amount of time in New York. Um, this is his second time back to the United States, and he realized that he could not um, go and be in the United States, away from it all, well taken care of, enjoying life, knowing what was happening in Germany to his people and certainly to the Jewish people. And he determined that he was going to go back to Germany and he was going to suffer alongside of his people. And I don't know how many of us would make the same decision to do that. Uh, Bonhoeffer became a member again of the German resistance movement. Um, he was convinced after much soul searching that uh, he had to work towards Germany's defeat under Hitler if he was going to save his country. There was no other way ab about it. That's what he had to do. And he recognized that he had been raised up as a theologian in Germany. He was honored. He was a man of influence. He was a man of many connections. And so he, he felt that he could do something to make a difference. Uh, from 1940 to 43, Bonhoeffer worked on his study of Christian ethics, which um, we could certainly use some of that today. He, uh, it was grounded in the, uh, the idea of a biblical Christ, a biblical Yeshua, as the concrete unity between God and the world. So this was a very important to him, and uh, he did a lot of research and a lot of wrestling with that particular concept. Um, sections he completed were lab later published, and it was called Ethics. This, um, this was after the war in, in uh, 1949. Now, um, Bonhoeffer was really one of the first German Protestants to see the implications of the rise of Nazism in Germany. Um, after Hitler came to power in 1933, Bonhoeffer helped organize something called the Pastors Emergency League. And he really became the center, the nucleus uh, of this of the confessing church. And the confessing church, which was had separated itself from the German Lutheran Church, was filled with basically anti-Nazi German Protestants. So there were many, uh, maybe not enough, but there were were those who had separated themselves from the German Lutheran state-run church joined the Confessing Church uh, to speak out against what was going on, and, and they, they clung together, and, and it did grow for a period of time, uh, the Confessing Church. Uh, in 1935, and, and we have kind of a picture here of Bonhoeffer and his students, he returned to Germany and he founded something, they called it a clandestine seminary, because it had to be under, uh, under, under wraps 
basically to train the pastors in the confessing church. Now, you imagine starting an entire new work, and then you've got to uh, build a foundation, and you've got to train up leaders, etc. And so that was one of the things that uh, Bonhoeffer was responsible to do. Um, and he, so he founded this seminary and trained pastors. And uh, this was in a place called Finkenwalde. And he continued on, even though the Gestapo was harassing them, uh, he continued on to do this. He organized this, this seminary, if you will, uh, as a sort of a living workshop in the Christian community. And, and through that, he developed very close relationships with his students. And there's a, quite a long section in the book that talks about those relationships with the students and how he set it all up and how it was kind of hidden and, and really how important it was to train them. And out of this experience then at uh, Finkenwalde was uh, the book that came, um, The Cost of Discipleship. This was um, published in 1937. And it was ra basically a uh, a clarion call to the community to, to actively obey what Yeshua proclaimed on the Sermon on the Mount. That's what he did. And um, it's a groundbreaking book, and certainly anyone who's been in any kind of discipleship uh, within the church or any, any kind of instruction, seminary, or whatever, has read it. But I would just, the viewers of this program, I would really encourage you to read it because it will probably shake loose some things that... Uh, Maybe you haven't considered, and maybe you need to. Um, one of his whole family was uh, was part of the resistance, and in particular, he, his brother-in-law, uh, Hans van uh, Donani, he was a Supreme Court justice uh, in Germany, and uh, he actually was instrumental in sort of uh, helping British intelligence. Um, the confessing church at this time had pretty well separated itself from the national church. And Bonhoeffer recognized that this was really the only place that he could work for change, that he could not work within the German state-run church for change. He, change. he had to start outside. The next sort of step that he wrestled with was his military service. Of course, the Germans were called up. And he had to figure out where on earth he was going to serve. And so, some, this is where some sort of say he was a pacifist because he didn't serve in the German military. But what he did do is he joined the Abwehr. Um, his brother-in-law was uh, connected there, and so it helped Bonhoeffer get in. Uh, the Abwehr was basically the German intelligence services. But it was a place, it was uh, this sort of element in Germany where a lot of anti-Nazis, where people who um, were not supporting what was going on, where they actually served. Um, of course, at this time, the Nazis are forbidding any kind of meetings in a church. And uh, so it's getting more difficult for these people members of the confessing church to meet and to be so they got to do everything kind of underground under wraps and uh, you know you've seen many a, a movie about the resistance and what they had to do to get messages through and how they were going to meet and how they were coordinating things so nothing different different here uh, eventually with the help of his brother-in-law he joined in on the plot to assassinate Hitler um, and uh, he certainly wrestled with that, but he felt that that was what he had to do. Um, in 1943, he became engaged to Maria von Wedemeyer, and uh, she was quite young, quite a bit younger than he was. Uh, they were engaged for quite a period of time. He was, she was, in fact, a longtime acquaintance with the family. And, of course, he was arrested in April and... Uh, that never happened. And while he was incarcerated at that time, he wrote uh, letters called Letters and Papers from Prison. That, that actually was published in 1951. Uh, we have a picture here also of the Buchenwald SS Barrack, where he was held at one time. Uh, again, it, during this time, he's a member of the Abwehr, Abwehr, the German intelligence organization, which actually had been founded in 1921. It was used as a concession to the Allies. The Allies demanded that, that Germany's uh, World War I intelligence services be for defensive purposes only. And, of course, uh, from 21 to 44, that's kind of how it operated, um, although, of course, once it came under 
uh, Hitler has sort of moved out from the defensive pur purpose to the offensive. Um, after February 4th, 1938, um, the Abwehr came under uh, someone called General Canaris. It actually was very much like the Department of Homeland Security that we have today. Uh, again, uh, just to, to reiterate here, he was in the Obwehr, which means the German military service. It was actually the center of the anti-Hitler resistance, okay? And then again, his brother Donina uh, was the one who played a, a significant part. Um, he was continually harassed by the Nazis, as you can imagine. He was forbidden to speak in public. Um, he was required to regularly report anything he was involved in, all his activities. Can you imagine to the police, which sort of feels like we're kind of headed there. Um, in 1941, he was then forbidden to actually print or publish anything. Can you imagine this man who is gifted in his soul with his writings and and uh, he was not allowed to basically speak, <laughs> write, publish, or uh, if he did join in any activities, he was required to report into the police, which, of course, he did not do. Uh, Donani, his uh, brother-in-law, was the one who was responsible to bring him into the Obwehr because he felt, because Bonhoeffer had so many connections, uh, and especially in the ecumenical world, that he would be of great use to Germany in this context. And so, this obviously pre uh, prevented him, protected him, if you will, from uh, uh, conscription into active duty in, in Germany. and was a way he could deal with this. Uh, we, and we have our map here of what his connections now between Norway and Sweden, et cetera. He was basically an undercover guy who served as a courier for the German resistance movement. And because of his, um, his contacts and, he, and being in the Obwehr, he was able to kind of move about in that. And uh, the idea was to try to get the information, once they got it to Sweden and Norway, was to get it back to, uh, into, to England and to the Allies, uh, although that proved to be very difficult, even though he had a lot of great connections. The British really didn't believe any of the information that was coming out through uh, Bonhoeffer and his family and they pretty well ignored them. And they basically, this the German resistance movement got no support from the Allies, which is depressing when you think about it. But uh, all his contacts um, uh, led to, all these connections led to him moving out in a lot of different directions. And uh, he, he camouflaged those uh, legitimate um, uh, travels to Norway and Sweden under the guise of the German government and, and, and the intelligent activi intelligence activities, uh, he was able to then get word out. It's, it's just hard and it's heartbreaking to think that nobody responded to what he was trying to communicate. Um, we have a photo here of his parents' house. This was ground zero, really, uh, in Berlin for the resistance movement. This is where they met and uh, was an important place. It's, a whole family was, in, was involved in this. Um, 1932, he wrote a sermon, basically said that the blood of martyrs might once again be demanded, but this blood, if we really have the courage and loyalty to shed it, will not be innocent, shining like that of the first witnesses for the faith. On our blood lies heavy guilt, the guilt of the unprofitable servant who is cast into outer darkness. So you can see just from these quotes how much he had to wrestle with his place and with the things he was thinking about doing and, and being involved in the resistance and speaking out against the government and uh, taking a stand to defend the Jewish people and being involved in the, in the plot to kill Hitler. He had to wrestle with his own guilt about maybe doing things that, that violated what was, uh, what was commanded in the scriptures. Uh, he also, another quote here, he described modern secular, secularization as the world's, quote, coming of age from earlier religious and metaphysical dependencies into autonomous ways of understanding and coping with life. And let me just continue on. He just, you know, such a world, religion was individualistic, otherworldly, 
piety and dependence upon God as a supreme being was dying out. And we'll kind of uh, end this, this session really with that. This was, uh, this was what, what was happening, that the, the world of the Christian became very much uh, individual-centered, not so much connected to uh, a, the community at large. And this idea of the supreme being and this, this dependency upon the one true God was really becoming a thing of the past. And uh, you don't have to look very far to see that the same thing is really happening in our culture, in our community, especially among young people today, do not see uh, any kind of understanding uh, that their life needs to be totally and wholly dependent on the one true God. And so we see, the, again, the rise of secular humanism, just as it did in pre-World War II Germany. We see it alive and well, and many of us would argue that our our culture has pretty well become a secular humanist culture, where people um, do not have any kind of understanding of God himself or who he is and the, and the importance of being connected to it. So we'll just kind of end that here. We're going to pick it up next time and continue on talking about the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who is a sign for our times. Shalom.